excited to be here. Am I on the? Okay, good. Uh, I've got a couple of devices in my hand, and if I look at my iPhone, it's not because I'm distracted. And I'm <laughs> I'm doing email. I've got some notes here. Uh, this is all new material, and I think even over the course of today and kind of leading up to this, I was inspired to look back um, and really try to come up with some hard lessons that I've learned. Um, in the spirit of feedback, when I sometimes when I present, um, I go too fast. So if I'm going too fast, just tell me to slow down. Uh, and also sometimes I don't smile. So if I get kind of glum, just tell me to smile. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So I'm calling this 10 tweets for startups, um, 10 lessons for building a company, 10 aphorisms. They're all kind of 140 characters. I think you'll enjoy them. I live in California. I used to live in New York. I'll go through some of my background. So this is me. I used to love professional wrestling growing up. That's Jimmy Superfly Snooker. I grew up in Boston. Love Larry Bird. He used to live near me in Newton. Jim Rice and the Red Sox. And they used to suck, and that's why I love them. And Schlafman and I love the Patriots, and we just lost the Super Bowl that I was at. I got into theater. Uh, Avant-garde director named Robert Wilson was a real inspiration. I went to Interlochen Arts Academy for theater. Uh, I love New York. I lived there for 20 years. It's kind of chronological. I went to Columbia University in New York. I studied Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, the philosopher, uh, who's still an inspiration to me. I went to work at Flatiron Partners with, with Fred Wilson as a VC. I collect old computers. I bought a huge collection on eBay one night. <laughs> I, uh, I started an investment research company called Majestic Research um, that took internet data and turned it into investment research for investors. I have two boys, an amazing wife, and I uh, live in San Francisco. That's my son's bar mitzvah day. Um, I don't know uh, what came next. Okay, I started Pure 38 in San Francisco, a great incubator where Instagram started. I started a company called Social Media that did the first social ads. There's me hidden. I like to ride my bike a lot. Um, I did a century on Sunday. I'm an investor in Cy Hill's company, Gumroad, which is awesome. I was his first investor. Um, I like Edward Sharp uh, and the Magnetic Zeros. I just saw them in Oakland. Uh, I'm working out of Index Ventures now, which is a venture capital firm uh, in San Francisco. I've gotten really into electronic dance music and DJ culture through Turntable. Um, and I love Diplo and Major Lazer, and I think it's a huge market, and I'll talk about that. Okay, that was me. And there's me at the Mount Tam Disco Party fundraiser wearing my mother-in-law, mother may she rest in pieces, jumpsuit from the 80s. Okay. <laughs> Uh, next slide. Um, how many people have used Turntable? Cool. Um, whoever didn't raise their hand, turntable.fm. It's really awesome. Um, people love it. People get addicted to it. Um, I think it's really changed for the, those that use it. Um, the whole notion of listening to music online. You listen with your friends at the same time. And I'll show some screenshots. Uh, we were rated the number one music startup of 2011 by Billboard. Um, we had an amazing year. Um, there's a really, really interesting Inc. Magazine article uh, this month, May. How many people have seen it? Anybody? Yeah. So I'm a little embarrassed to talk about it. It's pretty, um, it's painfully honest. It's a story of me and my co-founder, Billy Chasen, and about what really goes on with co-founders, not the puff pieces that go on in a lot of uh, technology blogs and journals. Um, it's a long piece. It's a couple thousand words. It's, it's written by uh, a great writer who took the time over a couple months to follow us along. And um, I encourage you to read it. Uh, it's not great for the company. It's not bad for the company. It's th it doesn't put me in a particularly good light or Billy. But I think it's honest and authentic. And I think we need more of that, more long form journalism and not about, oh my god, what did PATH just raise money at? OK, Turntable, for those that haven't used it, is a crazy world where people listen to music together. I know Philip Rosedale's in the audience, and in some ways it's inspired by Second Life. It's a world, you have avatars, you play music, you have a cue. Um, the, more, the more points you get, the better avatars you get. My favorite's the gorilla. If people like your music, they give you points. 
it has a great dynamic, a social dynamic, where when you're up there DJing, if you play something that's too popular, it's kind of lame, because they've heard it all before. If you play something that's too obscure, then no one really kind of grooves to it. So you're really driven to, just, to come up with music that people haven't heard, but they should hear. So it's a great discovery engine. Uh, it's a human-powered algorithm. It's a human-powered Pandora. And uh, we're in the process of expanding it internationally. We started here. When we opened up, we had a, a big audience in Japan and Brazil. So we got licensed so we can do it officially now. Works on iPhone, too. We made a huge gorilla um, at South by Southwest. Um, it was always my dream. Aside from raising capital and doing deals with the six major, four major labels, I was probably most excited about this. It's a 25-foot inflatable gorilla that went outside of um, our party for 1,500 people in South by. Did anybody go to our, any of our parties at South by Southwest? They were awesome. They were fantastic. Um, here's a That's a track with dancing avatars on stage. There's about 1,500 people. And uh, I really love this brand. I love what we've built. I love the idea of connecting the online world to the offline world. It's something I've been fascinated with for a long time, uh, starting in 98, 99, when I got my first BlackBerry and I created a portfolio for Flatiron Partners of pervasive computing companies. We also did something in April where Every Tuesday, we picked a turntable DJ. This is one of them from Turntable. We flew them all expenses paid to Las Vegas. We put them up in the Cosmopolitan. There's an avatar in the go-go booth up on the windows. You see people in Las Vegas strip, kind of freaking out. Um, again, this is all about um, online and offline convergence. It's about celebrating our DJs. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun, and I feel that a lot of what we do in terms of music online is not fun. It's, um, it's kind of boring. It's kind of, uh, uh, it's functional. You know, it's a big database where we say what music we want to listen to, and we have editors that tell us what we should listen to. Okay, so now we're going to go, that's kind of my background and what I'm doing now. Now I'm going to go into the meat of the presentation. Just bear with me. Okay. So I really want to put it out here and, and be vulnerable. And the strengths that I find most important in entrepreneurs are not just confidence and aggressiveness and focus. It's also vulnerability and authenticity, um, and importantly, emotional intelligence. I've definitely failed more often than I've succeeded. I started my first company, a CD-ROM publisher called Riverbed Media, right after I graduated from college in 1992. The web hit a couple years later, and I jumped in. I did HTML just like Ted and made $50 an hour. I got fired a couple of times because I'm really bad at working for people. And um, I ended up starting a company called Site Specific um, around the same time as uh, Scott Heiferman started Meetup. And uh, we started out of the same apartment, and Clay Shirky was my CTO. And it was just a great time to work with friends and hustle and build something. And uh, it was magical. And I sold the company a couple of years later. In 99, as a VC at Flatiron Partners uh, with Fred Wilson, I invested about $70 million across 10 companies. And in 2001, I lost most of it when the market crashed. I've sold companies, I've shuttered them, and I've spent most of my time grinding it out while they go sideways. I've definitely made a fair amount of money along the way, and I've definitely lost money. And I've built great relationships, and I've also burned a lot of bridges. And so. It, these are little tidbits. First, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Um, I learned this from Barry Diller via my wife, Tina. Don't wait, period. <laughs> Don't wait for the right moment. Don't wait until you know you can do it well. If it's a good idea and there's a market that needs it, just do it. This is what separates entrepreneurs from entrepreneurial people. Entrepreneurs can't work for other people. We're unhirable. We are annoying. We are stubborn. We're narcissistic. 
We're obsessed about a single problem that we just can't shake out of our minds. A lot of people are entrepreneurial. They can be part of an innovation team. They can brainstorm. They can think about out-of-the-box ideas. They can read Fast Company. They can use whiteboards. They can go to off-sites. And this is definitely good for companies to have entrepreneurial people. But that's not the same thing as being an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is a pathology. Uh, it's a sickness. <laughs> there's, there's no putting your toe in the water. You're already in, you're swimming, you're gagging for life, realizing that it's too late to go back, and that you might as well just, just keep going. We talk about failing fast, about always making new mistakes, about failing forward, and we talk about how the perfect is the enemy of the good. Wittgenstein, who I mentioned before, had a great um, phrase in Philosophical Investigations, which he wrote in 1950, he said, we've got onto the slippery ice where there is no friction. And so in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal, but also just because of that, we are unable to walk. We want to walk, so we need friction back to the rough ground. Um, and I think that's a perfect illustration of um, just do something badly. The friction's OK. If, if you wait till it's perfect, it's definitely too late. OK, number two. I'm more or less on time. Uh, a coach said to me about seven, eight years ago, leaders believe it before they see it, and managers need to see it in order to believe it. Typically, there's a market out there as an entrepreneur, and you know it, you can feel it, you can sense it, but everybody around you wants to see it. So they say, show it to me, prove it to me, help me understand how you're going to get there. And this is what we always hear as entrepreneurs. We're surrounded by these managers. They're business partners, they're investors, they're potential employees, they're family members, they're friends, and there's nothing wrong with them. It's simply how they are. It's how they think about the world. You can't change them, so you shouldn't try. We need managers because they help us prioritize, they help us focus on what's important, and they help us execute consistently. And all these things are really tough for me. I don't know if they're tough for you. So the role of the leader, I think, is, is vision. You need to see a problem in the market that you know is there, and you know it's getting bigger, not smaller, and no one has seized upon it. There's no great solution out there. I mean, some entrepreneurs do really, really well copying and executing better. Um, a lot of them have made so much more money than any of us. Um, and I don't want to point fingers. Probably in the beginning it was Microsoft. And there's a lot of companies now um, that are not only doing that here, but in particular do that overseas. Right? So they copy Groupon, they copy Zynga, they copy eBay, and then they sell it back to people here. And I don't know if they're really entrepreneurs. I mean, they're called entrepreneurs, and they're definitely taking risk, but it's much more of an execution play. Um, and that's just different to me. I think your ideas should be strange and weird and nonsensical. Um, if everybody agrees with them and think it's a good idea, then there's probably something wrong. And your job is to convince everybody, potential hires, investors, potential customers, and this is a really important term, that your vision is inevitable. It's inevitable that this is going to happen. Someone's going to do it with or without you, so it might as well be you. And a lot of what I coach with entrepreneurs is that inevitability. And if you exude that, and everybody around you starts to spend time with you, and just like, wow, I, I guess you're right. I guess it's inevitable. Um, there's a, a German uh, writer who, who wrote, Walter Benjamin, who wrote, the great categories do not acquire their significance as the names of special disciplines, but as monuments in the discontinuous structure of the world of ideas. And so what that means is um, invent a new category. And that's the big win, right? So you think about um, cloud-based storage as a category, and look at Dropbox as a multi-billion dollar company that's just minting money. You think about um, sharing apartment space, and then you think about Airbnb, um, photo sharing with Instagram, curating the web as, as a category that didn't exist before, and checking in at Foursquare. Um, I'll never forget in, in 98, 99, my wife, who's a co-founder of iVillage, and um, 
with the AOL and ran social networking, uh, and most recently has been running babycenter.com for Johnson & Johnson, uh, we were sitting down and we were talking about, with a friend of ours, you know, what's going to happen to media? What's the future? And she said, it's going to become social. It's going to be social media. When you think about, and this is 98, when you think about um, greeting card sites and you think about um, invitation sites, they were just coming on the scene then. So I went to Network Solutions and for 9.99 bought socialmedia.com. Um, and it was a new category, and, and the power to invent that and see that um, is what leadership is all about. Okay. Next one's kind of weird. Um, I'll share it with you. <laughs> um, dress British, think Yiddish. <laughs> um, so I kind of look back, like, where did this come from? And one person says from 1962, it means to, to look conventional, but to think unconventionally. Um, and there is, uh, also they're saying Michael Bloomberg was said to have dressed British and thought Yiddish, um, which is consistent, I think, with his behavior. And I, I learned it from an art dealer that I worked for in 93. Um, I used to schlep paintings for him all around Beacon Hill in Boston. He usually wore black socks and sandals and drove like an old um, station wagon. Um, he didn't quite embody the aphorism of, of, of looking British. Um, it makes me smile when I say it. It means a couple of things. For startups, I think it's really important to have a good brand. It's important to have clean UI. It's important to have a, a good business card. But you need to be shrewd and, and pay wholesale, not retail. You can't spend a lot of money to build your brand. If you think about the best companies out there, Google, Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, WordPress, they all have in common great brands, great branding, great colors, great fonts, and, and happy feelings, and they've spent nothing, at least in the early days, uh, on their marketing, on their branding. Okay, hold on. Next one. This is the newest one that I've come up with, um, which is definitely consistent with today. And, and it says, scale a single social gesture. So it's, a, it's the billion dollar challenge. I always used to refer to the, the phenomenon in the 80s during the Microsoft era and what they did, but Word process, there were word processing companies. Um, anybody remember WordPerfect? This is a total age question. Um, how many people have never heard of WordPerfect as a company? Oh, come on. <laughs> um, WordPerfect, the company, through competition became WordPerfect, the product. Through competition became WordPerfect, the feature within, I don't know what office suite. I think it was Novell had an office suite. And I think the internet in some ways has flipped it, which are features are becoming products are becoming companies. And it, it probably started with Yahoo and Google um, in the late 90s, there were, you know, a directory of links, a search engine, and you know, big companies. And the most powerful features these days are social gestures. So if you think about, um, you know, Instagram got bought for a billion dollars. You know, what got bought? Why did it get bought? Why did it scale? It, in some ways, it wasn't even photo sharing. It was freaking filters. People like to put filters on their pictures. And that, in some ways alone, just created this whirlwind. Um, I use Path a lot. Who uses Path these days? Cool. Um, and Dave and the, and the crew are awesome. And Dave's an investor in Turntable. And I'm an investor in his wife's company, Brit, um, which is awesome, too. And um, I think about Path. So what is that feature that might scale? to become a big product and a big company. And so it's not even the filter, because Instagram did that, and it's not photo sharing or checking in, but that little plus button is awesome. I don't know why, but I just, I like hitting it. I like touching it. I like interacting with it uh, as a means of uh, sharing in that social diary. Um, obviously, checking in through, tw through, uh, through Foursquare, uh, early on, uh, tagging on Delicious. Um, the best investors these days you know, I'm partial to Fred Wilson, Matt Kohler. They're just, they're really good at finding these social gestures um, that will scale and that will go viral and that will amplify. Obviously, this applies to consumer-oriented tech companies and that's not all that we're doing here. Okay. This is kind of obvious. Hire slow and fire fast. 
And too often we do the opposite. We feel the pressure to build our organization quickly. I see I stopped smiling, you guys tell me to smile. Um, and so we hire somebody to fill a role so that we can then focus on the next hole in our team. In the rush to hit our goals and satisfy our board, um, we put on our beer goggles, and so the B-plus developer, for the moment, looks like an A-minus. And then like acid, once in the small team, the, the habits and the workmanship of this B-plus corrodes the culture of the A players, and suddenly the A players slip into B territory. And so if the new hire isn't cranking away at all hours, solving hard problems with good solutions, um, then why should the other people be killing themselves to do so? And again, it's not that the new hire isn't good, he's just not good enough. He's good enough, barely. But he's not a rock star. And so we tolerate the B+. Plus. In some ways, it would be better if it was a C, because we would know, obviously, that we've got to get rid of him or get rid of her. And so I've seen this again and again at companies that I've run and companies that I have invested in and advised. The Bs never become As. They just don't. <laughs> um, and it's not just their skill set. They might learn a new language. You might sit down with them and say, um, OK, you know what? We need to kind of pick it up a notch. But um, in my experience, it just doesn't happen. Um, the, the key is to course correct quickly, because that conversation just gets more and more difficult and heavy, and you don't want to do it. I have lots of examples of this, but I'll share with them later. Um, this is important in, in business, in life, um, in relationships, um, and really in startups and really early on. It is have difficult conversations, not in email and ideally not on the phone and, and not tweeting, but, but really working things out. Stay connected through conflict, as I've learned in therapy over the years. Um, we avoid them because they're hard. And so all of you should you know, take a moment and think about an issue that's hard to express, that you want to talk to your partner or your co-founder or your boss or your friend that hasn't been easy to bring up. And don't, don't wait. <laughs> um, it will never be convenient. If you avoid them early on, you create a culture of grin-fucking, where everything is sort of fine, and, and you just kind of avoid really communicating. And you start to talk to people through other people. And you're going to uh, you're gonna create a culture of side conversations and disingenuousness. You'll spend most of your time confiding in your friends and your investors about that other person is just not so-and-so, and they don't understand you, and they don't appreciate your value or your perspective, and then you're partner will do the same. And all that energy that should be directed towards your product and your customers uh, and hitting the market is just going to be displaced. Okay, I've got 12 minutes left. I am four tweets away. Okay. Um, so I've kind of gone from the startup experience and, and starting a company to um, now building your company, building the product, amplifying it, um, and now into raising capital. And we can use raising it for the, some, of the most, some of us need to raise capital from investors. Some of us just need to raise awareness. And this is relevant to um, you have a metric that's going up and to the right. Um, it's not always um, number of users. Uh, the the corollary, the sort of the inverse to this is there's nothing like numbers to ruin a good story. Okay, think about that. Um, we talked before about, I think Sahil talked about, you know, uh-oh, if you have, or no, I think Ben did, if you, if you have revenue, or Sahil, I don't know who talked about it, somebody did. Um, if you have revenue, they're going to judge you on that, and chances are your revenue is not growing as fast as your users. There's one company, a social application company in 2007. Um, I was running another social application advertising company. I'm so proud of my $15 million of revenue the second year, and I raised money at a $30 million valuation, and, and he had no revenue, and he raised money at a $500 million valuation. I'm like, how the f fuck do you do that? Um, but that chart was going up and to the right. Okay. So, and this is particularly relevant in this part of the cycle where we are in the economy, 
in the ecosystem. It's focused on growth at any rate, um, at any cost. Nothing grows faster than eyeballs, users, downloads. Don't let anything get in the way of your story. Find the metric in your business that's going up and to the right and slam the table. Is it number of users? Is it users per month? Is it the number of downloads? Is it the revenue? Is it the earnings? Is it the number of awesome engineers that you've hired? There's a company I've been helping where probably their key assets, they've got an unbelievable team of engineers, which in Silicon Valley in particular is just so hard these days. That might be the key metric that helps them raise the capital, the valuation they need. Uh, is, it, is it the number of happy customers? Is it the amount of engagement? Is it the number of four-star reviews? People are going to judge you no matter what you say, but I think that you have control over, over how they judge you. And so they might want to say, well, look at these metrics. No, no, no. This is the metric that's important to me. This is how I'm running my business. It's really important because it defines your success. Um, I struggled with Billy early on to say, okay, what's the metric for turntable? Is it the number of users? Is it the number of songs played? Um, give me something quantifiable, the smart uh, description of goals. Simple, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-based, right? So that's what and he's like, no, it's none of that. So, you know, what is it? And he's like, I want the users to love the product. I want them to love the service. And so it's hard to quantify that, but that's his metric. And you know what? People, the people that use Turntable love it. Now, we could definitely have more users, we could have more revenue, um, but that's his metric, and that's why I believe we're really successful. Okay, this kind of gets into the money side of things, because in the end, um, someone also mentioned this, you know, raise money when you can, not when you have to. Um, we all remember 2000, 2001, we remember 2008, as much as you want to minimize dilution and maximize control, the number one, start, the number one reason startups fail is because they run out of money. It's so much harder to raise money when you need it than when you don't. I know it doesn't make sense. VCs are not commercial bankers. Um, Sahil's a really good example. You know, he, I was the first, and I met him, I saw him, I met him actually in a turntable room because I was looking for someone to build the, the app for turntable and um, he was there DJing, someone said he's a good iOS developer and I met him the next day in Mountain View and um, convinced him to build a, the turntable app when he was on a little vacation in Singapore. And then he started the company and I wrote his first check and he raised about a million dollars and he has three employees and he's spending $25,000 or $30,000 a month and doesn't need any money. He's executing, he's got a good chart going up and to the right of a key metric, you know, no amount of transactions a day. And then Kleiner Perkins comes in unsolicited and says, hey, here's $7 million. And he's spending $30,000, $40,000 a month. So just think about that. Um, and if we do go through a nuclear winter, um, which we will, and I don't know if it's today or tomorrow, and it might wait until Facebook goes public, but something is going to just hit the system and all this liquidity and all these incubators and all these incubators of incubators are going to just hit a wall. The risk premium today is gone. It's, it's no longer, I mean, this is sort of a testament, it's, it feels too easy to start companies. It should be really hard. It should be an agonizing decision. Um, more people, significantly more people than not, should not start a company. Um, but it's now very, very fashionable. And if you think about at least Silicon Valley, there's going to be thousands of engineers out of Apple and out of Zynga and Facebook and Twitter that in the next six months are going to fashion themselves awesome angel investors. They're going to all be Ron Conways. Um, and that's just really, really dangerous. So be afraid. <laughs> um, raise as much money as you can. and. Um, you know, bulls and bears make money and, and pigs get slaughtered. Okay. This I've, I've learned. <laughs> um, very hard to bring an investor in, right? And you're in such a frenzy to raise the capital, to pay your people, to build up a team, and to keep the dream alive. And we think that raising the money is an achievement. And if we can just get him 
or her to write that check to give us $500,000 or $5 million, that all our problems are going to be solved. And we put on the beer goggles again. We don't do our diligence. Sometimes we just we think about the, the firm, right? And again, we're, we're naturally insecure as, as entrepreneurs. Um, we want to be loved. We want people to invest in us. Don't focus on the firm. Um, focus on the person. Spend time. I mean, Sahil spent a lot of time with Mike Abbott. Um, so it wasn't about client or investing. It was about this person who's going to spend time on his board. Um, I had a company where just for years it w we had a horrible investor and, and we couldn't get him out. And the more you try to get an, a bad investor out, the more they think the company is worth. Um, dangerous. OK. Last tweet. Um, My friend Peter Borish in New York told me this. It doesn't make any sense, but I use it all the time. <laughs> um, it's not about the money, it's about the money. <laughs> um, so clearly there are the extreme examples of, you know, Kevin Seistrom of Instagram, if you do the analysis, made $700,000 a day from when he started Instagram at Pier 38 to when he exited. Um, the Facebook wealth being created is astronomical, um, frightening. <laughs> um, just the number of millionaires and people that you know, got there early and now have $10 million or $100 million. Um, that being said, as my grandmother-in-law used to say, like, don't be too proud for a profit. Right? And so there's, an, there's a startup I've been helping. Um, and he's built a good business. It's a sort of a social entertainment experience. Social TV, connected home, mobile. And um, he's, he's, he's a hustler and he's getting revenue. He's not a product guy. Um, he's not a consumer product guy. Um, he's not a coder. But he's built a good business and he has real revenue. He's got great relationships with the carriers and the TV manufacturers. and. He thinks he could sell the business for six, seven, you know, low eight figures. Um, his investor, big time venture capitalist, has made you know, oodles of money, says, you know what, you can do that. It's not a big win. Or you can go for the big exit. And so it becomes a, a pride thing. Um, the, the chances of the billion dollar exit are you know, 1% and 99% total failure. You know, the, his chance of having a good exit and making money for his mortgage and his family and his employees' money um, for their families, I don't think it's 50%, but it's probably 30%, right? Um, and so I have another example that was cautionary for me back in 99. Um, I was fortunate in 2000, at the height of the first bubble, I had all this stock, this private stock, this public shares, it was paper. And I really believed that you know, the internet was changing the world and that the NASDAQ was going to keep going up. And one of my partners was the biggest believer. He was just like, he, he could not stop talking about how this time it was different. Media was changing. The internet was a superstar. These valuations were real, that these stocks were actually undervalued. And so I, I bought into it, right? And I didn't double down. I didn't buy options or anything. But I held on to most of my stock. Meanwhile, he was behind the scenes turning everything into bonds, right? And then the market collapsed, and I was the schmuck. Um, and he was fine. And so this may not appeal to a lot of people. This may not apply to a lot of people. Um, it's just important to kind of keep perspective because we are being fattened like cows by our venture capitalists to think big and go for the home run. Um, and even though they would rather have, I mean, Excel was a struggling VC across tons of companies, and all they needed was Facebook and their heroes. And it changes the dynamics. And so the venture capitalist thinks like that. They hedge their bets. They want, you know, a billion dollar outcome. And if it doesn't happen to you, sorry, you know, start another company. Okay. 
I'm always looking to invest um, in great entrepreneurs and advise them. My email's here. I'm starting something new. Um, I don't know what it's going to be quite yet. So this has been a good exercise for me, and I apologize for looking at the notes. Um, it's the first time I've given this. And so it's helpful for me to meditate on this and, and recognize my own patterns and think about the ones that have actually led to success and led to good feelings and try to avoid the ones that have led to failures and bad feelings. And I've got 10, 9, 8 seconds left. Um, thank you for listening, and I'd love to talk to any of you afterwards. All right, three minutes. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think uh, I can take a couple questions. You want to line up at the mic? We have like, time for about uh, three questions, and I'll ask the first one if that's okay. Uh -oh. You mentioned something that really jumped out to me about the importance of being vulnerable, authentic, and emotional awareness. And I'm curious, that came with age maybe, but I'm curious if that, that, that bravado you had early on, or maybe someone called it recklessness, could you still be as successful as you are right now without that early in your career? Without EI, without emotional intelligence? Um, no, without that early bravado you had maybe early in your career, the, the lack of emotion. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, failure is humbling. I mean, when, you, when, it, when a really good employee quits um, or an investor freaks out on you or you run out of money, um, you know, I was like Mr. Hustler. I've just like run through walls and you realize it's probably because you weren't paying attention along the way and then it's too late. It's like any relationship. I mean, after it's, you know, after they break up with you, you're like, oh, come on, I'm going to change. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead. My name is Megan, and I had a question about the point you make about um, raising money when you can and not when you need it. And I wanted to ask you, um, speaking as an entrepreneur, not a <laughs> speaking as an entrepreneur, not a VC. Um, what do you? How do you balance that? Like when someone's saying, you know, I'd love to give you this money. How do you balance that with giving up that equity and? What do, you, what do you think is the balance with that? And well, how I mean, can you make an intelligent decision about well, it? it the, the related to that is, is, is that sort of point about you know, not working with assholes as investors, right? And knowing that you can't get them out. So yeah, you might be, you know, there's a good story a couple days ago about the founder of Branch who, you know, in New York, young kid, sat down for 15 minutes with some guy. said, I love you, I'm gonna give you a $500,000 check. And he's like, whoa, right? So that, it doesn't mean just take any money when you can. Um, in the case of Turntable, I've known Fred Wilson for a long time. He's an amazing writer, an amazing thinker. And he's a great investor, and we, are, we agreed at evaluation. And then after the fact, a big VC firm in, in Silicon Valley said, forget Fred, like, we're going to give you twice as much money at twice the valuation. Here it is. And I was like, no. <laughs> so I, I raised the money, but I was, and I wasn't that concerned about dilution because until you're public or until you get sold, your valuation doesn't matter. In some cases, as I, I, I'm, the next company I create, I'm actually going to lower the valuation because I don't want the overhead, the, the guilt. Right? I, I raised, you know, I had a company a couple years ago, I raised it at a pretty high valuation on the second round. We had a big chunk of revenue and a platform that we were built on just changed the rules and the revenue plummeted and every single day that investor's like, I invested at X pre. It's, such a game. it's a total game. Where do you expect Turntable will be in three years? And could you talk at all about the recent label uh, licensing deals that you guys? Um, but where will Turntable be? I don't know, but I hope it's everywhere. <laughs> um, I hope it's international. We're trying to make it really easy for people to enjoy social music. Um, right now, we've got a a fanatical core of DJs that many of whom are unemployed or because of turntable are becoming unemployed because they spend too much time on it. Um, and that's great, but a lot of people that have jobs just can't afford to spend that time. So we want to make it easier for them. We want to um, expand to other uh, devices. Uh, the labels were uh, an interesting experience when you're negotiating with uh, someone on the other side of the table where you have no leverage. And if I was 25, I would have been like, 
fuck you, Universal. You know, you want this percent of my company? No way. Um, what I realized is as I did that, you know, they said, I want X percent. And we're like, no. And then they, and I said, okay, we'll give you a little bit. And they said, you know, I want X percent. And so at a certain point I realized, like, they have their music. You can't get the music anywhere else. Whatever revenue share they're going to ask for at a certain point, you just have to consent to. And as soon as I realized that, I was like, well, why spend 12 months negotiating when I can get a deal done in six months in the same way as a VC, suffer more dilution, but, but keep moving faster. Moving fast and getting into the market um, is essential. Hmm? Okay, good. Thank you.